please. Mr. President, thank you, Commissioner and Presidency. I've tried, uh, along with my colleagues, to maintain a constructive approach throughout uh, when compiling my report. Uh, at the same time, I make no apologies for self-examination on behalf of this House uh, with a verdict of room for improvement. May I thank my shadows for their equally constructive approach. There are two questions which run throughout the theme of uh, the report that I've produced. Why do we need to argue uh, or pursue the smart regulation agenda at this time? Uh, secondly being, why now? This is clear, the current economic circumstances are dramatically affecting our businesses. And as I speak with them, I find that alongside all the traditional difficulties and challenges that they have had, they face specific and particular ones today, such as raising capital in the current financial situation, and recruiting a talented workforce from within the EU. We as policymakers must do our very best to support these engines of the European economy. Yet, lamentably, our current regulatory framework continues to stifle the business and entrepreneurs seeking to create jobs and growth in Europe. Setting up business in Europe is actually getting too costly and time-consuming. Why should it cost four times as much to set up a business in Europe as compared to the US, Brazil, or indeed India. And in times of highly mobile capital, fast-paced innovation, and ever-quickening production cycles, the economic cost of holding up business with such bureaucracy is unsustainable. Our maze of regulation directly affects our citizens, a considerable number of whom have lost their jobs during the financial crisis and are now seeking new opportunities for work, and it is hugely important that new businesses are supported and are able to create new employment. More broadly, the flaws of our, the flaws of our current legislative approach only raises doubt in the minds of our citizens. As soon as you leave the bubble of Brussels, most ordinary Europeans find it very difficult to understand what the EU is. And when they see the effects of some of what originates here, they ask, whose side are you on? With such immediate problems, focus undeniably turns to the short to medium term. Yet even greater challenges await Europe in the future. Domestically, we face generation-defining problems in the energy sector and managing the environment, together with finding a successful growth model for the 21st century. Many of the issues affect the very fabric that makes up our society, and we must not divide into extremism or disillusionment, but come together to find the solutions. These difficult challenges must be met with the best policy responses built up through evidence and consultation, so as to ensure that the public can understand and support the solutions that governments and the European Union find. Our attention must not only be focused on ourselves here in Europe, though as the rising competitiveness of our neighbours throughout the world makes it essential, we do all we can to support innovation and growth in our economies. With India and China literally breathing down our necks, it is essential that the EU and the member states take action to create a framework fostering economic competitiveness and promoting growth if we are going to be able to meet this long-term challenge. Europe has once been the leader in developing ideas and exporting its success across the world. We must remain open for business. We must create a new vision of Europe, one which is seen as the most attractive place to come and work, a place of opportunities, not one of difficulties and complications. I'm no advocate of the pull-up, the drawbridge Europe. Much to the contrary, Europe must remain open for business. This is why the closing approach to immigration in some of our member states concerns me. Having spent much time steering the EU-India FTA through this House, I despair at the obstacles being put in place in some of our member states. The loss is clearly ours. Our, the improved mm. approach mm. to time, policy Mr. making... Time, you had only four minutes. Mr. President, I will conclude in that case um, simply to say this, uh, the approach that we need to adopt is one which needs to be on a joint approach basis between the Commission, Parliament and Council. I hope much of what is in my report you will find acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Karim. Mr. President, may I thank the Commission and Presidency and Council 
uh, for attending and participating in this debate. May I thank colleagues for the very well informed and detailed and constructive debate that we have had take place here today. It's quite clear in terms of better, smarter regulation, the core theme needs to be about reducing burdens. I recall very, very clearly in 2004, President Barroso coming to address uh, the gathering of this house in Brussels and pushing for an agenda to reduce burdens through reducing legislation that currently sits on the books. And I can't recall the exact figure, but it ran into many, many thousands that he said needed to be repealed and put to one side. Commissioner, I'm very encouraged to hear that you say you will reach and exceed the targets by 2012. And that is why I argue that we should have a particular commissioner who is responsible for coming and reporting to this House, saying how far on this agenda you have proceeded. And I want to be able to stand here in 2012 and congratulate you or whichever colleague it may be that takes on this task and say, very well done. I had doubts and I told you today I have those doubts, but you did it and I congratulate you for it. The one in, one out principle that I've advocated in my report has been the subject of much debate in committee and here today also. But as the Commissioner has quite rightly said, when we get this right, we don't just have one going out, we have 27 going out. But that raises a further issue in terms of harmony and uniformity of approach. We don't always get that, and that is why I argue that the gold plating issue in national parliaments is something which needs to be addressed, whilst underlining the subsidiarity principles and issues that the presidency has uh, picked upon quite rightly. And I finish, Chairman, simply by saying this, that there are in particular two colleagues who were present uh, to make their contribution, but they have decided to leave the hall now. I find it thoroughly irresponsible when Europe faces the immense challenges that we are facing today, that rather than advocate that we come together for the betterment of all of our nations and all of our constituents and citizens, their approach is simply to say we should do nothing.